Next up, polar coordinates. What's the use of polar coordinates? You can use polar coordinates to describe magnetic fields. This is one of the use of them. They help us to calculate integrals easier. They also help us to calculate the derivative and other calculus operations. The definition of polar coordinates. To define polar coordinates, we first fix an origin, O, that we call pole, and initial ray from O. So from the origin or your pole, you have a horizontal line toward the right-hand side, which is positive x-axis, and this is your initial ray. Then each point P can be located by assigning to it a polar coordinate pair, which we denote by Rn theta. R is the directed distance from O to P, and theta gives the directed angle. So basically, you have O, the origin, or the pole, and you have a point, we denoted by R and theta, and R is the directed distance between O and P, and theta is the angle between the positive part of x-axis to P counterclockwise. So the polar coordinates is described as P of R and theta, where R is directed distance from O to P, and as we defined, theta is the directed angle from initial ray to OP. So from XY coordinate system to polar coordinate system. From polar to rectangular coordinate system, R times cosine theta is X, and R times sine theta is Y. Now, from rectangular coordinate system to polar coordinate system, x squared plus y squared, taking the square root, is r. And given x is not 0, y divided by x is the tangent of theta. Remember that we are going back to pre-calculus. In pre-calculus, we learned that the inverse tangent is bounded between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, that's why we could define a 1 to 1 function and the inverse of that 1 to 1 function. If r is positive, a coordinate theta of p is, for positive x value, it is inverse tangent of y divided by x. However, if x is negative, it means that it's located on the left hand side in the second quadrant. For the third quadrant, then theta is inverse tangent of y divided by x plus pi. And if x is equal to 0, theta is plus minus pi over 2. So it's important to take a look at these basic definitions, review pre-calculus to feel comfortable about calculating theta, which is the inverse tangent of y divided by x. So these are the formulas that we just learned. Suppose you have a point Q, which is written in polar coordinate format. R is equal to 3, and theta is 5 pi divided by 6. We want to calculate the rectangular coordinates for this polar coordinate point. First of all, x is r cosine theta r is 3, theta is 5 pi over 6, so you have 3 times cosine of 5 pi divided by 6. Remember the unit circle chart. This is equal to 3 times the cosine of 5 pi over 6. You can find 5 pi over 6 and calculate 
the cosine, which is negative square root of 3 divided by 2. If you simplify this, your x is negative 3 square root of 3 divided by 2. So we calculate x. By definition, y is r sine theta. Again, r is equal to 3. And you calculate sine of 5 pi divided by 6. So for the sine of 5 pi divided by 6, you basically have 3 times a half. This is your y value, as you remember. For a unit circle, the y and sine are equal to each other, and it becomes 3 halves. So in polar world, you have 3 and 5 pi divided by 6. And in rectangular coordinate system, you have negative 3 square root of 3 divided by 2 and 3 halves. One important aspect of polar coordinates is helping us to calculate the double integral. Double integrals in polar coordinates. Polar coordinates are convenient when the domain of an integration is an angular sector or polar rectangle. This form. So it's a circular or half a circle or some sector of a circle. The region is R. And as you can see, you have R1 and R2 as two radii. Theta is bounded between theta1 and theta2. And R is bounded between R1 and R2. That's how we describe the angular sector or polar rectangle. So this guy here is basically a polar rectangle. We assume that R sub 1 is positive and all radial coordinates are non-negative. Recall that rectangular and polar coordinates are related by the formulas x is R cosine theta, y is R sine theta. So, we write a function f of x and y in terms of r and theta in polar coordinates as f of r cosine theta and r sine theta. Then, the change of variables formula for a polar rectangle r is the double integral over region r of the function f of x and y dA, which is the integral, the definite integral of f of r cosine theta and r sine theta, r dr, and r ranges between r1 and r2, then you're taking the integral with respect to theta as theta bounded between theta1 and theta2. There's an important notation that dA is r dr d theta. It's a common mistake for students that they forgot to add r down here. And their calculation is going to be wrong if r is not present as variable here. But what's the proof behind this? Remember that if theta is measured in radians, the area of sector is a half r squared theta. This is what we learned in algebra. Now, if you think about a smaller polar rectangle this way, well, this is the length r, this is just the radius, and this is a small portion that calculates the difference between theta, which we denote by delta theta. This length here is the arc of length r delta theta. And delta A can be approximated by R delta R times delta theta. So this is basically a rectangle, which is very small, polar rectangle, delta R times this length, which is R delta theta, is your delta A. 
Delta A is the difference of areas of two sectors. What are those sectors? One of them is a half R plus Delta R to the second power. This is the larger sector that we are calculating the area times Delta Theta minus a half R squared Delta Theta minus this smaller sector. So Delta A, which is area here, is the difference between this larger area and this smaller area, which is the blue sector. But this can be written as R times Delta R, Delta Theta plus a half Delta R squared, Delta Theta, that can be approximated by R, Delta R, Delta Theta. Basically here, you just expand this as R squared plus 2R Delta R plus Delta R squared, then distribute a half into parentheses, and you can factor out Delta Theta as well, and then simplify this as much as you can. So as you can see, a half R squared and negative a half R squared, they get canceled out. That's how you end up with the rest of the terms as you see here. So delta A, we showed that is R, delta R, delta theta. This is this small rectangle in polar form here. Now, the double integral of F dA over region D can be written as F of P times the area of D. This is just approximation. At the beginning of double integral lecture, we talked about this. P is any sample point in D. So you have the area of the base times the height, and it gives you the positive volume that you're looking for. Now, decompose R into N by M grid of small polar sub rectangles, R sub IJ, which are these small sub rectangles here. Choose a sample point like P sub IJ in R sub IJ. If R sub IJ is very small and F of X and Y is continuous, then the double integral of F over R sub IJ can be approximated by the height F of P IJ times the area of that small rectangle, which is nothing but F of P IJ times R of IJ delta r delta theta now each polar rectangle r sub ij has angular width delta theta which is theta 2 minus theta 1 divided by n and the radial width which is delta r r2 minus r1 over m well the integral over r is the double summation of these small double integrals which is nothing but the double summation of f of p i j times the area of r sub i j. As you remember, for each p i j, we can substitute them by sine and cosine. This is your x and this is your y. And you take the double sum of these. After taking the limit, you can basically write the double integral of f dA as the double integral of f of r cosine theta, r sine theta, r dr d theta, r ranges between r1 and r2, They're basically functions of theta, or they might be constant, and theta bounded between theta1 and theta2. Again, be careful about dA, which needs to be written as r, dr d theta when you're using polar coordinates calculating the double integral.